So with that, I'd like to close this and invite Tim to the stage here. So our first speaker is, is Professor Timothy Abels, uh, Tim for France, or for, for in short. Um, and Tim is Professor of Computational Metabolomics in the Imperial College. There's an extensive uh, bio on the website, so please visit that. Uh, and I don't like to take time from Tim while he gives his talk about metabolomics-driven uh, data integration. So please, Tim, go ahead. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in uh, Nijmegen. Uh, it's my first trip outside of the UK uh, for a scientific meeting since uh, COVID, so um, what better place to come and, and see some old friends, meet new people, and, and talk science. So um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, data integration, but driven by metabolomics. So. I'm a, a computational, mathematical, statistical scientist working primarily with metabolomics data, but where we get involved in data integration is where the metabolomics studies are uh, combined with other omics and uh, other types of data throughout, uh, uh, you know, from other areas of science. So um, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, uh, on, on the slide here, so I'm going to begin with a few concepts around data integration, so what are the ideas that we need to be thinking about? What are the problems? What are the challenges that you can face when you're trying to integrate data? Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the first one being within omics integration. So actually within metabolomics, we have big data integration challenge purely within uh, the, uh, the assays and the data that we have uh, within metabolomics. And that's some work which has recently been published in analytical chemistry. And then I'll give an example from a cross-omics integration project where we're combining genomics data with uh, metabolomics. And finally, I'll look towards the future and talk about some new methods, what we're thinking about based on pathways, uh, and uh, point to some future prospects. So data integration concepts. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen slides like this before. It's uh, systems biology and the omics sciences, so we have if my pointer will work, oh yes, there it is. Um, biology conceptualized as many different layers of different molecular, uh, biomolecular sort of organization. We have the genome, uh, the transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, and of course there's many other layers one could think of. But I think the important thing is to think about it as uh, these uh, layers of different entities that are connected by causal and not, uh, and, and a causal relationships depicted by these arrows here. We have many different technologies that can uh, assay those uh, levels of the different molecules in the different layers. And so ultimately with integration, what we're talking about is trying to combine the data that comes out of these, uh, these different technologies you can see on the right-hand side. Now, metabolomics, for those of you who have not come across it before, I hope most of you have, but just in case, it's the study of the complement of small molecules within biological systems. So we might have... Uh, uh, a, a biofluid that uh, encompasses tissue and cells that, that uh, are within that, and of course we have uh, different biological molecules in those various compartments. Um, the different uh, samples that we can take, uh, so the cell, the tissue, the biofluid, can be influenced by many different things. I've just written down a few of them here, and the levels of the metabolites in those compartments will be influenced by those as well. And of course we can assay those using metabolic profiling technologies. I've just shown you a picture of a, uh, uh, an MR spectrum and uh, uh, a mass, uh, an LCMS trace uh, there, is, which is one of the technologies that, that would be used. But I think the key point about metabolomics is that it's untargeted. So we don't uh, make an a priori decision about which metabolites are involved in the process at the beginning of the experiment. We look at the end, we try to measure as many metabolites as possible, and at the end we come back to see uh, w what is the important biology that we've observed. So, if we come to data integration, one of the biggest questions, I think, is why do we want to do it? Everybody always talks about data integration as a sort of a big uh, <coughs> goal, especially in multi-omics analysis but we often don't think very hard about exactly what we're going to get out of it. So here are a few thoughts about that. Um, a clear point would be that we get better information retrieval. So if we're going to integrate multiple types of data sets, we ought to be able to uh, have new angles, new insights into areas which we won't have seen before if we're just looking at one data set at a time. 
That could be uh, related to um, understanding uh, and modeling confounding effects, for instance, so different types of effects coming from different uh, levels of, of biomolecular organization. It could increase our statistical power just by recording more data points. We uh, are able to see smaller and, and, and more noisy effects, if you like. And particularly for metabolomics, a key point is that by combining data sets across multiple different assays and perhaps with other omics as well, we're able to identify or uh, get information about identifying unknown metabolites, which is a key problem in metabolomics. But of course, data integration, especially in multiomics, is mainly about trying to understand the whole biological system. Um, we may want to look at associations between the different ohms, so the genomics versus the proteomics versus the metabolomics, for instance, and look for those connections that I showed you on that previous slide between the different levels. Um, we may want to actually model the system itself, and by measuring and integrating data across multiple levels, we should be able to get a more accurate model of the system and thus be able to predict how it will behave in the future or perhaps how it will behave in response to an intervention, such as a drug. And finally, we'll be able to group molecules together, whether that be between or within uh, the omics levels, so that we can come to understand how they behave together in groups or pathways, for instance. Different types of omics integration people have talked about in many different ways. So here are just a, a, a few of them. This is something that we put together uh, more than 10 years ago. And people were talking about integration then, and it was all very fluid and difficult to define. So we thought we would put some names on it. So we came up with conceptual integration, where the data are analyzed uh, individually, and then the human inside their head tries to build a story that connects the different uh, levels of the, of the data together. So that would be conceptual integration. And then, of course, at the other end of the scale, you can have a mechanistic model. So something that may be a system of ordin ordinary differential equations, for instance, or some other kind of network-based model that can allow you to uh, actually make, uh, oops, that's gone back the wrong way, um, to make predictions about the levels of individual molecules in uh, the data. Now, that is a very, very powerful technique, but it requires a huge amount of information. You need to know many, many parameters of the system to be able to make those mechanistic models work. And unfortunately, we're not at the stage where that's an applicable technique for the large uh, uh, sort of systemic models that we'd like to make for the most part. Um, so the level which we're usually interested in is what I would call statistical or exploratory integration, where what we're looking for are statistical relationships between the different uh, molecules in the system. Perhaps you might call them correlations, or they don't have to be linear correlations. And we're looking to connect molecules in that uh, statistical way so that we can then start to explore how they affect each other and whether uh, uh, there are connections between these different levels. So that's what we're mainly interested in. Other people, though, have, uh, have conceptualized integration in other ways. So imagine you have these uh, different levels of uh, biomolecular organization, as I uh, said before. Um, vertical integration has been uh, a, a key term which has come to the fore. And the idea of that is to combine data across different omics levels. So you can see that it's a vertical arrow in my picture there. And that means combining uh, things, say, across genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. So that's a very uh, easy concept to understand. But the key, key point is that the individuals in an experiment would probably be the same, but they've been assayed by different technologies. But it's the variables that dif are different in the different data sets. So you may have genomics variables, metabolomics variables, etc. But then, of course, you can have horizontal integration. If you have multiple cohorts of people or uh, sets of experimental units that are in, uh, 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 assayed by omics data, then you can integrate in the horizontal direction. And in that, would, that case, you would be integrating in a horizontal way where the variables would be the same. So for instance, you have two metabolomics data sets from two different cohorts, but the individuals are different. So that's vertical and horizontal integration. And the final way that people have uh, uh, conceptualized integration is in the early, intermediate, and late stage. So there's a little bit of a busy diagram on the right there. But just to uh, point out what this is, early integration has been uh, proposed as where you model uh, the data by concatenating those individual data sets together. So you just take the metabolomics data, the proteomics data, the genomics data, push it all together and plug it into some kind of machine learning or statistical model. It's the, probably the simplest way of doing things. 
but the idea is that the data are combined at the early stage, so that's early integration. Intermediate integration would be a more sophisticated approach where the model uh, takes each of the individual data sets, but it doesn't combine them just by concatenation. It develops some kind of model of each of those different blocks and tries to predict an outcome depicted by those bars at the bottom in some kind of multi-block or multi-view statistical approach. And there are many machine learning models that try to do this. Uh, and the last approach would be called late integration, where the model predicts uh, an outcome with each data set separately. So we take the metabolomics, we try and predict, say, a health status with that, just that data. We do the same for the other omics, for instance. And then the model has a second stage where it combines those predictions together. Perhaps it might be in some kind of ensemble modeling approach if you've come across machine learning models like that. So that's uh, a very common uh, set of terms to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, data integration also. Now, data integration has a huge set of challenges, and many of these are biological, but there are also many uh, uh, sort of statistical or machine learning data science challenges. And this is what I've written down here. Um, we have uh, things like the measurement scale. So the measurements can be continuous, like we might have gene expression measurements or metabolite levels. But we can also have ordinal, so that's ordered data, one, two, three, four, it might be disease stage or something, or categorical data. And trying to combine measurements together from those different domains is quite hard. Um, the statistical distribution of the data makes a big difference. It might be normal or it might not be. And typically, a lot of the data that we uh, assay in metabolomics is not normal by, uh, by default. And there's definitely covariance or variance between uh, different metabolites, uh, different variables in the data. Of course, as everybody probably knows, we often have missing data, we have outliers, we have a lot of noise, and the sample size, crucially, is never enough. If you speak to a statistician when you're designing an experiment, I'm sure they will always tell you you need a sample size that's much bigger than you can afford, and that is a big problem in general when we're designing and analyzing uh, omics data sets. And finally, because we measure so many molecules, we have high dimensional data. And that's a classic problem where the machine learning people come in and they uh, show us all their fancy models, which can deal with that. And it does work quite often, but there are some problems as well. Not least that the data are often collinear, which just means that the variables are often very strongly correlated, meaning the actual true dimensionality of the data is actually smaller, which might sound like a good thing, but it makes it harder to analyze by conventional techniques. So overall, all of those aspects make for the problem to be uh, one of heterogeneity. So the data overall ca cause many different kinds of problems, and the general impression is heterogeneity. Um, and that's a sort of concept, I think, which uh, one needs to remember when, when one's trying to do data integration, because that's what you have to deal with uh, at, a, at a high level, if you like. Now, there are many different ways one can design experiments uh, where one might then want to integrate the data, and uh, they get progressively more tricky to analyze. So this one would be the, uh, the standard approach, where what I call matched samples. So imagine you have sets of biological replicates uh, depicted by these flasks here. So perhaps this is a, a cell experiment. And we take each of those biological replicates and we assay them with the various technology. You can see we've got uh, uh, some kind of um, genome, uh, genome microarray there and an NMR spectrum from the metabolites. And then we can model that data against some kind of response or class or disease or something like that. And that would be a straightforward or relatively straightforward uh, design to deal with. But we also often come across what I would call unmatched sample designs, where although we have the same biological condition, we don't have the same biological replicates that are used for each of the technologies. So in this case, you can see that one set of biological replicates are used for the transcriptomics, and another set of biological replicates are used for the metabolomics. And for that, for that reason, we now lose the connection between the individual biological replicates um, so that we can't uh, match the levels of, the, of uh, in this case, the transcripts and the, and the metabolites in them. And that means we have to do the integration in a different way. A third kind of uh, abstraction, if you like, or a higher level of a, of a design is something like this, where we might have a dose-response relationship, or maybe it's a time series, um, in this case, depicted as a time series, and we are uh, measuring essentially the same kind of response in the different omics levels, but the time points are different. So it might be that we haven't been able to take the, t the samples at the same time points for the, uh, the different types of assay. And of course, 
there's still the same kind of underlying biology we expect to be going on, but the way in which we can actually then model that requires not only uh, crossing between different uh, biological replicates that we had in the top right of this slide, but we also need to connect across this continuous uh, dimension, in this case time, by having some kind of interpolation probably. And then finally, we might have something which is a very general kind of uh, integration where there's a, a, a treatment, for instance, a drug, um, and maybe we're comparing two different treatments that we know affect the same pathway or the same type of mechanism within the system. And we want to be able to integrate that data. And of course, now we've got things which we don't know for sure affect exactly the same molecules in the same pathway. So there are different uh, uh, ways that we want to analyze that too. Um, I often think of integration with different dimensions, okay? So here's uh, my sort of conceptual idea of uh, integrating data. Firstly, we might have uh, the two dimensions of the platform. So in metabolomics, we can measure uh, metabolites with LCMS. We can measure them with NMR. Um, and if we, say, uh, have two different uh, sample types, so, oops, I'm losing my pointer again. No, it seems to have gone. Okay, never mind. On the horizontal axis, you can see that we've got different sample types, in this case, blood and liver. So that big um, red ball is supposed to show you that we've taken one uh, type of assay, in this case, an NMR, on blood. But of course, we would actually quite like to have different data sets from different sample types with different technologies. And so by integrating this data, we can find out different things. For instance, if we integrate across the spatial domain, so the same assay type, but now different sample types, blood and liver, what we're looking at is spatial interaction. So for instance, what's the difference between the circulating versus the organ-specific pools of metabolites in this case? But we might want to integrate the data in a different dimension across, in this case, the different um, uh, assay types. So between NMR and LCMS, some of the metabolites might be the same that we assay with those two te uh, technologies but they might be different. And the idea of that would be to ex both extend the coverage, so measure more different metabolites, but also to identify potential unknowns by connecting their signals in the different technologies. Now, of course, that's not the only dimension. We have the cross-omics dimension, so which I've depicted here by biomolecular level. So for instance, perhaps we measure transcriptomics as well. We collect many different data sets uh, on these different samples, and we can integrate the transcriptomic data. We can integrate across that cross-omics, uh, uh, that biomolecular level dimension. And the main point of that is usually some kind of mechanistic understanding goal. Ultimately, we would like to be able to integrate all these different data sets. But the problem is, usually, it's incomplete. We typically don't have all the types of um, assays across all our sample types. So again, we're seeing that heterogeneity is coming to the fore. So what decisions does one need to make when one, uh, one is thinking about integrating data? And this is going to be a fairly busy slide, so I'll whip through it fairly quickly and just hopefully you get the general impression. The first, and I think the most important thing, is to decide what the aim of the experiment is or why are you trying to integrate the data? Are you trying to just explore the data? Are you trying to predict an outcome like a disease class? Or are you actually trying to uh, develop some kind of biological understanding? Now, you might say, actually, all three of those are important. But you probably need to think about which one is the most important. If you're just exploring data, which I would always recommend at the beginning when you've collected data, there is lots of different techniques that can be used. So direct correlation, just looking for those statistical relationships. Some more sophisticated version of that with uh, latent variable models, for instance. Or perhaps a pathway model, looking at enrichment across the different omics. Um, if you want to do predictions, well, correlation doesn't really help you, um, but some of these other methods will do that. And of course, you've always got the mechanistic models if you have enough parameters in the system that you know about. The biological understanding um, is the one where you probably need to have some kind of pathway description or perhaps the mechanistic model. But ultimately, um, you're going to be thinking about other questions next. So for instance, is this an intra or inter-omic? connection that you're trying to make. What kind of samples have you got? So do you have the unmatched or matched replicates, for instance? Do you have different time points for different types of omics, for instance? And all those things will make an, uh, an effect. 
And a key point, and which is something which I often discuss with people um, asking for advice about integration, is whether they have modeling expertise. So do you have a bioinformatician or a, or, a, or a sort of data science expert in your group? If you don't, then probably going for things like the direct correlation or the pathway enrichment approach are feasible approaches. They're relatively straightforward to do, and you can still get something quite nice out of them. If you do have modeling experience, then a mechanistic model could be an option, but again, only if it's available and you have complete uh, reasonable knowledge of the parameters. So if you do have, if, sorry, if you don't have those, that knowledge, then probably something like the pathway enrichment is the one to go for. Whereas if you do have that, then perhaps the me mechanistic model. So you can see um, there are many different uh, uh, sort of paths towards getting an integrated model, and uh, it's quite hard to come out with uh, the, the sort of best route. OK, so I'm going to give a couple of examples now of integration that we've done in our group over the last few years. And the first one is uh, the more recent one, which is combining untargeted metabolomic data. Um, and this is an example not of vertical integration, but of horizontal integration, where we have different sample sets uh, measured with the same assay. And some of the problems we have with those are, you know, do, is the assay reproducible? So if we run it on different cohorts of people, are we getting the same measurements? Are the different groups of people actually biologically comparable? Maybe one group is older than the other, for instance. And finally, how on earth do we cope with the fact that in metabolomics, we don't identify the analytes a priori? So we're trying to match uh, a set of maybe thousands of variables from one cohort of people versus thousands of variables in the other cohort of people without knowing what those analytes are. You may think that's an impossible thing to do, but actually, we have a very talented postdoc here at Imperial, Dr. Rui Pinto, who has actually managed to effectively solve this problem for uh, LCMS. Um, what you see here is uh, uh, an LCMS trace with retention time versus uh, mass to charge ratio, and each dot here is one detected peak, if you like, throughout the whole data set, so across a, a large number of people. And the question is, if we do that for one set of people and we do it for another set of people, how do we know whether this uh, variable here is the same or different uh, metabolite from this variable here? Okay, so it's a very tricky problem, as you see, when we only have the MZ, so the mass to charge ratio, the retention time, and the intensity of each of those uh, peaks. That's the only information we're going to use to try and integrate them. Well, Rui built a very complex uh, but really nice pipeline to do this using very simple concepts of looking at the, uh, the, the differences in the mass to charge ratio and the retention time, modeling these trends. You can see some, some nice sort of non-parametric modeling, then doing some scoring, uh, tightening up the, uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, boundaries of the model, and finally coming out with uh, a feature matching approach, which um, when we tested it with uh, many hundreds of actual known compounds in the, in the test data sets we used, was 97% uh, accurate. So 97% of the compounds where we knew exactly what their identity was were matched correctly without using the identity. And here's just a, a quick demonstration of uh, the before and the after, if you like. So I can go backwards and forwards. You can see that before we have lots of, of uh, peaks, if you like, and after we don't have so many. And that's because not all of the uh, peaks are detected in both cohorts. But the ones which are, you can see, remain in the final uh, matched set. And we can do more than that just by uh, using a little bit more information. So for instance, now we're looking at including isotope ratios, uh, adduct networks, so looking at relationships in the mass to charge ratio, developing those into large uh, sets of, of multi-networks, if you like. And that's allowed us to match uh, very different metabolomic assays, uh, uh, again, without using I any identity information at all. And I know I'm uh, uh, running out of time, but I uh, just wanted to show you a very nice approach that uh, Ruiz used that also uses this correlation between intensities, mass to charge ratios, and retention times to effectively do a chemical map using this uh, un, uh, unsupervised machine learning technique, UMAP, where we can map both the identified metabolites and the unidentified ones, which are in black here, and try to then map out the chemical space that's uh, accessed by the ma uh, metabolomic assay. So, the second example I'm going to show is a betweenomics uh, integration, in this case between metabolomics and genomics. So genome, metabolome, and we're going to 
uh, look at the relationship between those variables and a phenotype. In this case, we're looking at diabetes and body mass index. And one of the ways in which we're going to do that is by looking at uh, the correlations between metabolites, correlations between variables. Now, we're used to looking at changes in mean levels. So if you have a disease group and a normal group, like we might have over here, we've, I've just plotted two metabolites, for instance, we can easily imagine how we're going to differentiate those two different groups uh, according to, in this case, the mean level of metabolite number one. But, um, and we can do that by simple things like t-tests or Mann-Whitney tests, for instance. But if there is no difference in the means, does that mean that there's actually no difference between the groups? Well, there can be a difference in correlation. So look at this plot here. You can see that although the mean levels of the two metabolites are identical, there is actually a difference in the correlation between those two metabolites. So what we can look at is the correlations between sets of metabolites. And in this uh, demonstration here, we've got sets of people with uh, normal fasting glucose levels and impaired fasting glucose levels. And each node on this network plot is one uh, um, uh, lipoprotein measure from an NMR metabolite assay uh, colored by the different types. And you can see that the networks are quite complicated, and it's very hard to tell what's the difference in those correlations between the different disease uh, groups. So instead, what we're going to do is only put a link between these metabolite measures if there's a change in correlation between those two metabolites across the disease groups, between the, the sort of pre-diabetic and the normal people. And you can see this ends up with a much simpler network, which we can then interpret uh, in a more easy way. And I hear you asking, where's the data integration coming in? So here it comes. In this case, we're going to do uh, something a bit like a GWAS, so a bit like a genome-wide association study. This would be the conventional way of doing that. We look again at the mean level of, of a metabolite, and we correlate that versus uh, the genome. So for each uh, genotype, we look to see whether uh, there's a difference in the mean level of the metabolite. But of course, we can do exactly the same thing, but with correlations this time. So we can say, right, between, for instance, one SNP, we can divide the population into uh, the homozygous and the heterozygous people, for instance, and we can say, does the correlation change between those, uh, between those groups? So we're doing a very similar thing to a, a, a GWAS, but this time we're going to call it a genome metabolome differential correlation analysis. So we put this all together into a sort of integrated pipeline called Gemini, the genome metabolome integrated network analysis, and the idea was to look at uh, these uh, correlation networks in the different disease states, form this differential correlation network you can see in the bottom right, and then do the integration with the uh, genomic data via this uh, genome metabolome correlation analysis. Um, we did this with a large cohort from Finland, the North Finland burn, uh, birth cohort. In fact, there are two of them, the 1966 and the 1986 uh, cohort, which meant that we could then replicate our results in these two different cohorts. And we had a relatively small uh, metabolite data, only 38 serum metabolic measures, uh, and a huge set of SNPs. Of course, that's the normal thing when one comes to uh, genomic data. And we were looking, in this case now, at the BMI as an outcome, so essentially uh, a sort of uh, a obesity. Now, if you look at that data with a conventional GWAS, using a conventional um, uh, genome-wide uh, 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 p-value cutoff of 10 to the minus 8, there were no hits at all. So none of our uh, uh, SNPs came out as, as being important. But with this Gemini approach, combining the metabolite correlations with the genomic data, we found there were 24 uh, genomic loci at the same uh, level of significance um, that were actually uh, replicated across those two different cohorts. And we found that they were um, uh, associated with two particular meta metabolite measures, which were the extra large and medium VLDL particles. And so what you see here on the right is the set of uh, uh, genes which came up as being uh, associated with those changes in metabolite correlations. And I'm not going to go into details, but suffice it to say that the kinds of genes and, and mechanisms that came up were some things which had already been uh, known about in terms of uh, being associated with uh, uh, the levels of lipids and control of appetite and obesity, for instance. So, the last section of my talk is uh, looking ahead, um, looking at some pathway methods and some future prospects. So, I really like pathway analysis because it allows you easily to combine data across many different types of, of analysis. And the point is we're using existing 
knowledge, and we map metabolites, transcripts, etc., onto known pathways. But what's the problem, particularly with meta metabolites? Well, again, often we don't know what the identities are in untargeted data. Um, we often have low metabolite coverage, so it means that even if we do know the identities, we don't have many of them, so we only sample a small amount of the network. Um, the definitions of the pathways are somewhat arbitrary, so they may not correspond to the exact biology that's going on in the known experiments. And it is limited to things which you know about already. You're going to use pathway definitions from a database. So if there's something new that's, a, say, a reaction that was not known about before, it's not going to be there. But having said that, there are nice ways of doing it. And one thing that you can do to get around the identification of metabolites is to use this so-called mummitrog or Maastricht approach. And the idea of that is that they try to map the NZ, the mass to charge ratio of, of an unknown metabolite directly to pathways. Oh, that graphic hasn't come out very well, never mind. Um, and look for local enrichment within the network. So you expect there to be some false positive identifications because you're just using a single M, uh, MS1 mass to do that mapping. But if you uh, use a statistical approach to look for different areas of the network that are enriched, then that can actually uh, get around that problem. Now, often people are saying, well, what about deep learning? Uh, the machine learning methods are becoming very uh, uh, interesting nowadays. And yes, there are approaches that have been published for integrating data using deep learning approaches. Here's one example. In this case, they used um, uh, uh, genomic data for various types of, uh, of, of uh, levels of, of information. And they used a different neural network to encode uh, these different levels of omics, if you like, and then a second network or a second level of network to actually do a classification and relate the signals in the different ohms to the disease. Um, so it's a kind of two-step approach, and there are uh, more recent techniques that do it in a more sort of a, a, a simple way. But the big question about using deep, deep learning is, can you understand how the model is working? Why is it making the prediction that it's making? How is it combining the different omics data together? And as yet, I think it's uh, still early days to say whether you can get that type of information from the deep learning approach. So I mentioned that we were looking at pathway space approaches. And this is a sort of conceptual diagram just to illustrate that. If you have your uh, different assay types, again, we're talking now about um, vertical integration. And what we can do is map each of those different uh, omics, if you like, into the same pathway space. So we map the genes into a pathway space, the pathway, uh, sorry, the proteins and the metabolites all into the same pathway space where each column of these matrices that I've depicted here is a pathway now rather than an individual molecule, but we have our individuals in the rows. And then what we can do is put those together either by direct concatenation, as in early integration, or in another more sophisticated way, and relate that to an outcome via the usual machine learning approaches. Another way of looking at this is to think of the original data, for instance, for the gene matrix, it might be transcriptomics, for instance, as a set of data points in a gene space where each dimension is the expression of a gene. And by doing this pathway mapping, we're actually mapping the data into a new space where each dimension is a pathway. So now you can see how actually we're bringing the data into the same space to be able to do the integration. And here's some early results from uh, one of my PhD students, Cecilia Vida. And she's looked at an um, irritable bowel disease study where we have actually three different uh, uh, classes, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and uh, a non-IBD uh, set, uh, depicted by the different uh, bars on, these, on this sort of network plot you can see here. Um, and they've been looking at, uh, in this case, just one omics, LCMS from stool samples. And what she's used is a so-called single sample pathway analysis using kernel PCA. Don't have to worry about the details of that. But the idea is that she's been able to put, put all this data together into uh, a network of different pathways. So each of the nodes you see in this network is one pathway. And the colors you can see on what I would like to call the flag plot. And in fact, I think it's rather appropriate that I'm presenting this in, in uh, Holland. Uh, so you can see a few Dutch flags down there. And you can see that different, uh, the different uh, disease classes show up to different effects in, uh, uh, in terms of the sort of activation of the different pathways. And you can uh, isolate different parts of the network to try and interpret what's going on. 
So what are the prospects for data integration? I think, as I said at the beginning, the big question is, can we get a very clear idea of what we want to get out of it? So do we know actually what would make a successful integration of the data? And sometimes that's really hard to define. We do need a lot of standardization. Alain was uh, mentioning that earlier on. Genomics is very standardized. Metabolomics is pretty much the Wild West, and we're really working on that in our area to try and improve um, being able to match things between different laboratories, for instance. Um, we need to have easier integration with biological knowledge, so how to map all these different metabolic, uh, sorry, uh, molecular entities to the databases of pathways and, and reactions, for instance. And finally, as I said, the deep learning, it's very, very attractive, but uh, as denoted by these question marks, how do we know why it's making the prediction it's making? So interpretable or explainable AI is really going to be a growth area if we're going to use that for integration. So in conclusion, um, I think I'd just like to say there are many dimensions and levels of omics integration, so you can think about them in different dimensions from different angles. It's very heterogeneous. That's really the biggest problem that we have to deal with. And there are no standard or default workflows. So unfortunately, you're still in that sort of horrible uh, 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 sort of network plot that I showed of all the different decisions that you need to make. And it's not obvious uh, uh, when you're starting out how to do that. So if you've got data that you want to integrate, maybe these are the questions that you should consider. What is it you actually want to achieve by integrating the data? Maybe you don't have to. Maybe you can do that conceptual level of integration, which is more, more around sort of doing it in your head, trying to build a biological story. Um, what is it you already know about the system? Is it some, a system that is very well characterized? Maybe it's a, a sub-pathway within a, a biological system that you can model with a mechanistic model, or maybe it's something more complicated. And finally, how different are the data sets? Are they very heterogeneous? Is there um, a set of matched samples, or are we talking about something that's one of those higher levels of experimental design that might need to be modeled in a different way? So I think those are the main take-home points, and I would just like to thank the people whose work I've presented, particularly Rui Pinto, Cecilia Rida, Vida, and Beatrice Valcarcel, who did the genomic and metabolomic integration, and all our collaborators, uh, both at Imperial College and across the world. And I will stop there, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Well, thanks, Tim. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So are there any questions from the room? I'm sure there's a mic. Yeah. Please, at the front. Can you hand over the mic? Thank you for the sessions. Uh, please, I have a simple question. So till now, I don't understand why we integrate, for example, the SNPs and the metabolites. So if we like find uh, the differential metabolites and also the best SNPs. And after we did the analysis for each omics separately, we do the correlations afterward. So till now, I didn't understand why we do not do each omics analysis separately. Then we correlate the result of it. OK. I think the short answer is, if you do it in two steps, you may miss something. So there should be a higher power to do it in, in a, a sort of single integrated model where you can uh, see sort of very nuanced, very uh, small connections between these different levels. Whereas if you sort of do it in two steps where you essentially filter each data set for differential abundance first, and then you look for correlations, you may miss the connections which are not significant within their own data set, but are significant in terms of connecting the two data sets. So uh, I guess that's probably my main answer. There may be other advantages as well in terms of being able to uh, uh, sort of interpret direct links between the data sets in terms of the biology, but I think the main thing is in terms of um, being able to detect uh, lower level uh, signals that you might be unable to do otherwise. Yeah. And my last question, please. What is the, the main challenges for doing integration? So if you are working with integrator, because my main PhD is to develop integration method, and uh, I wanted to know from the expert, what is, do you like in the current existing method? <laughs> OK. Well, I mentioned some of the challenges out there. Um, it really depends what domain, what uh, sort of 
experimental design scenario we're talking about. If we're talking about the classic one of matched replicates, even then we have all those challenges I mentioned on the statistical slide, sort of heterogeneity of the uh, different types of variables, you know, the noise, the missing data, etc. Um, if we had to zero in on one thing, um, I think we would probably say it's how do you deal with the heterogeneous nature, so statistical properties of the data. So for instance, metabolomic data, relatively few variables, non-normally distributed, high degree of correlation. Uh, transcriptomic data, huge number of variables, thousands and thousands, perhaps more normally distributed. At least now we have labels on all of those. Metabolomic data, it's all unknown, and typically for an untargeted data set. So dealing with those kinds of uh, very disparate data across the omics is probably the main thing. But as I said, it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that. If you go to deeper levels, for different scenarios, you will have different problems. Okay, so it's hard to give one answer to that. Thank you. <laughs> Over coffee. Uh, there was a question there. Neil? Hi, Tim. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, so you included a figure where uh, you talked about uh, time points. So let's say you have a transcriptomic data set and a metabolomics data set, and they have like really um, different uh, temporal patterns. Uh, so, so they are not like linearly correlated. Then how you will correlate those uh, <laughs> transcripts and metabolites? Okay, so that's a really hard problem. I think the fundamental thing is we know that the different uh, levels of biomolecular organization work on different timescales, right? So, you know, expression of a gene may be uh, minutes or hours, and, and we know that metabolism is, is a much faster process generally, although, of course, it depends where we measure it, uh, depending on what. So, and the problem is we don't know those timescales well enough um, for an individual system or an individual pathway to be able to sort of model it in a very um, predictable way. Um, so my feeling is we have to have, the thing which connects the two is the time course, okay? So we have to make some assumptions about the type of response we might be seeing. So maybe if you expect there to be a dose response, for instance, you know, you have a stimulus, you have some response, and then it disappears again. That can give you the most basic information, even something as simple as low, high, or low. If you impose that constraint in both spaces, that then narrows down the sort of overall space, if, it, if you like, it reduces the number of degrees of freedom that you can, uh, uh, of uncertainty, if you like, in terms of correlating them, them together. But it's still not easy. You're still going to have to have that, uh, that model, and perhaps one simple way to think about it is that you may interpolate the genomic measurements or the transcriptomic measurements onto the same grid of time points as the meta metabolic measurements. So now you've got them on the same scale, but you still don't know which time point from metabolism is the right one to correlate with the one from transcriptomics. And I think really there, it's, it's not about knowing the right answer, it's about exploring. So maybe you try many different approaches and you decide which one uh, is, is able to give you a biological story that makes some sense. Maybe you have some controls in there, so you maybe have some approaches that you can take to test whether correlations make sense or don't make sense. But yeah, ultimately, um, it's, it's something that we don't know in a, in a generic system, so we have to explore it. Thank you very much. All right, let's conclude this session. And Timothy, I'd like to uh, thank you for your keynote. And I know if you've been here for, to Nijmegen for two times, I'd like to explore the city, and you're a graphical guy. So we bought something that combines both. Oh. So you can take it on a plane, obviously. Oh, wow. And there's much. a unique 3D printed chocolate bar, which is the Crossomics chocolate bar. Well, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> invent everything. Please. That's brilliant. And give an applause for Timothy, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.